I decided it was time for his rite of passage. It was the week before Christmas, and I called over my oldest son, Ethan. I said, don't tell your brother, but we're about to watch a movie. And then I introduced him to Home Alone, because what better way to celebrate Christmas than to instill within a young child the fear that there may be home intruders. And so... <laughs> We watched Home Alone, and he loved it. He was just—he he loved it, and, and he didn't say anything that day. A couple days later, we were driving in the car with his brother, and he started talking to me about Home Alone. And his little brother goes, "What is that?" And he's like, "What's well, the movie where the bad guys try to break in?" But then I'm like, "Stop! Stop! Stop!" And he's like, "Well, I've never seen that movie." I'm like, you're not ready yet, bud. Because I don't think he'd be scared. I just think he would booby trap our house and kill me. And so, I'm like, just, he's a lot like his mother. So I'm like, buddy, just, he really is. I'm like, buddy, no, you're just, you're just not, you're just not ready yet. And then I saw the tears start to, start to well up in his eyes. And he said, I can't wait to grow up. You get to do so much, so much Fun. That's what he said. You get to do so much fun. Hopefully grammar develops as well for him. But you get to do so much fun when you're older. I want to be older. I said, why do you want to be older? Because then I can drive, and then I can go do things, and then I can pay the bills. No, he didn't say that. I was hoping he'd say that, but he, he didn't mention contributing at all. Like right now, he's going to be a freeloader for life. That's where he's at. And he's just talking about this, and it took me back. It took me back to when I was a kid, and I remember the same thing. I had a sister who was two and a half years older than me, and all the time she would she would get to do something. She would get to stay up a little bit later than I would get to stay up, or she'd get to go see a movie that my parents said I wasn't ready for yet, or or she'd get to go have have fun. And and I just constantly remember wanting to get older and, and wanting to wanting to grow up. We expect that from kids. We expect for kids to, to want to, to be older. We, we expect that. We get worried about kids when they want to be younger, right? We get, we get worried about that fact. Some of you are, are living that right now when the, the 35-year-old, you know, is still in your basement. That's fine. But we, that's when we start to worry a little bit, when, when that, re, that sense of responsibility hasn't, hasn't caught up. That's when we start to worry and today what we're going to see in, in correction, and if you have your phones or your tablets, you can follow along on the Bible apps, and if not, it'll be on the screens, but we're going to dive into 1 Corinthians 3, and what we see as we continue this look at a letter that a guy named Paul wrote to a church that he at one time pastored in a city called Corinth, he's writing to them about their spirituality, and he uses terms that people would understand, and he uses this analogy of, of age, to get his point across. And so if you join us, we'd start this morning, 1 Corinthians 3, 1, where we read these words. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. And so what he's telling the people in the church of Corinth is, in terms of your spirituality, you aren't where you need to be. You aren't where you need to be. I can't call you somebody who's spiritually mature. I can't call you someone who's really spiritual. You're, you're young. You're an infant in Christ. Now, now, let's just stop right here and understand what this means. This means that the Christian life is a process. It means that the Christian life is a process, that following Jesus is a process. And some of you are brand new at this. Some of you have just given your lives to Jesus. You've just made the decision that you are going to follow him. And I just want to encourage you this morning, don't become discouraged because there's aspects of your life that you don't have figured out yet. Or there's things in your life that you don't have altogether. Don't become discouraged about that fact. This is a process. It's not immediate. And sometimes you can look at other people and think, wow, they've got it all together. Or sometimes you can look at somebody else, and without you even wanting to, they feel the need to tell you how they feel about your life, and they tell you about the ways that you're falling short and all the things that you need to do better. 
And so that can, that can become discouraging for you because you're like, oh, oh wow, well, here's somebody who said, I, I don't have this together and I don't have that together. Ignore those people. Ignore those people. Those people are critics. They hate everybody else, and deep down they hate themselves too. If They're just looking to point out everybody else's flaws. Now, if somebody has a vested interest in you and they're pointing something out to you in love, that's completely different. But for the critic who you didn't ask and they just feel the need to let you know, just just write them off, all right? But understand that the Christian life, that following Jesus is a process. It is not something that happens instantaneously, that your life just instantly looks exactly like you want it to. This is a process, and it takes some time. And so if you feel like, hey, I'm not where I need to be, and you just started following Jesus, that's great. Praise God. Praise God that you want to change. Praise God you want your life to look more like Jesus. And don't become discouraged in the fact that that's not instantaneous. Don't become discouraged in the fact that that's a process. So be encouraged and continue to grow. Continue to find ways that your life can emulate Jesus and you can become more like him. But now we get to the other side of the equation. And we get to the side of the equation for those who follow Jesus for a really long time. And whose lives don't look like it. And Paul continues, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? He says, for those of you who aren't new to following Jesus and who aren't where you need to be, you need to do better. You need to do better. This is like the football coach who's getting in your face a little bit. And it's not because they don't love you. It's not because they just want to yell at you or anything else. They just want, they see your potential and they see what you're capable of. And they see that you have so much that you could offer and there's so much that you could do, but you've got to get out of your own way. And because they love you and because they're concerned about you, they're going to call you on it. And that's what he says. He says, you aren't ready, and he uses the analogy of of a newborn. He says, you aren't ready for a steak. You aren't ready for pizza. And that's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. You aren't ready for that. Instead, you get milk because you aren't where you need to be. Again, we're not beating up on the person who's brand new to following Jesus. This is a process. And we aren't beating up on the person who's been following Jesus for a really long time, but whose life doesn't look like it. We're not beating you up, but we're just here and we're lovingly challenging you, saying there is so much more that God has to offer for you. Could you imagine? Go home today. Like, Brooke... Brooke does all the, all the food at our house. It's just better for everybody. That way we eat. Uh, because if I did, it, nobody would eat. And so I'd be like, hey, babe, what, what are we having? What are we having for lunch? Milk. And? Milk? Okay. I'm going out to lunch. <laughs> See you later. Hey, what are, we, what are we eating tonight? As we watch the game. Go Packers. Yeah, what, what are we eating? Milk. What? This is a big game, babe. Don't you think we should have a feast? Milk. Like, none of us would do that. None of us would do that. In the same way, we wouldn't go over to somebody who just had a newborn baby and be like, here you go. Here you go. I brought pizza. See if you like it. It's not going to end well. Anybody who's had a kid knows you don't introduce foods before their time because it's not going to end well. Even a taste is going to be disgusting. And so what we have to understand is the same thing is true spiritually. And for some of us, the question we have to ask is for as long as we've been following Jesus... Do we see any results? Do our lives look any different? Can people even tell? 
And here's the question that, that, everybody, that everybody struggles with, right? Because this is really hard to measure. How do you measure someone's spirituality? It's a very personal thing. It's a, it's a thing that can't be seen. And so how do you measure someone's spirituality? How do you measure your own spirituality? How do you do this? Well, he gives us the answer. When you're jealous and eager to fight, you're not where you need to be spiritually. When you are jealous and you are eager to fight, you're not where you need to be spiritually. When you look at other people and you're jealous of their success, when you're jealous of what they have, when you can't find joy in, in things for other people, when you are just consumed that it should be you, it should be your platform, it should be your possession, it should be yours, when you're jealous of somebody else and they're standing or what they've acquired, you're not where you need to be spiritually. And when you're ready to fight everybody, when you're ready to fight everybody, when you can't get along you're not where you need to be spiritually. That's what the passage says. And it ties in exactly with what Jesus told us. Jesus told us, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And what's the second? Love your neighbor as yourself. You want to know how you're doing spiritually? How well are you loving God and how well are you loving people? Sorry if that's a boring answer, but that's, that's, just, that's just the reality. And we get, we get caught up in so many other things. We, we, turn, we turn spirituality into this intellectual exercise where we have to memorize all of these creeds. We have to memorize all these verses. We have to memorize all of these things. And in the process, we miss the point so often. And Jesus says, here's the point. Follow me. Love God. Love people. That's the test for how we're doing spiritually. And when we are jealous and when we're ready to fight everybody, it means we're not where we need to be because we're not loving God and loving people in the way that we need to. And why does this matter? Well, because Jesus told us it's the greatest commandment, and since we're followers of Jesus, we should listen to him. And, and also this, we live in a world devoid of these concepts. We live in a world in desperate need of love, and Jesus says this, which is very interesting, to his disciples. He says, everyone will know that you follow me by the way you love one another. He says that in John 13, 35. Everyone will know you follow me, not by the words you speak, not but by the way that you love one another. And so the question that you have to ask yourself is, are you where you need to be spiritually? And the way that you can run the diagnostic test on yourself is to see, are you jealous are you ready to fight? He keeps going in verse 4. He says, For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not, merely, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave growth. Now Paul had been the pastor of the church. Apollos had served the church in Corinth. And so naturally there are some people who like Paul more. Naturally there are some people who like Paulus more. And he says, what, what is this about? Imagine this. Imagine you're, imagine you're having a dinner arranged with Aaron Rodgers. Right? Imagine that. Now, for most of you Packer fans, you'd be like, wow, that's awesome. For the rest of us, we'd be like, can we pick somebody else from the team? Like Aaron's feeling a little full of himself. So maybe you get Devontae Adams, all right? But whoever, whoever you're feeling, whether it's Aaron Rodgers or Devontae Adams, whoever it is, you're a Packer fan, you're excited, you've got the, you've got the, like you're going to have dinner with Aaron Rodgers or Devontae Adams. This is going to be incredible. Got the feast prepared. You clean the house a couple times. Plow the driveway, throw out a little bit of salt because you don't want them to get injured at your house and then be hated by all the Packer Nation. Make sure everything's set up. The doorbell rings. You're so excited. You're so excited. And you open the door, and it's Aaron Rodgers' landscaper. Like, oh. Hi. Or you open the door and it's Devontae Adams' Uber driver. Oh, that's not 
what I was expecting. It's not what I was expecting. Here's the deal. Nobody gets excited about somebody's servants. And so it should be in the church. It's not about us. It's not about who stands up here and speaks or who's up here who plays and and who sings. Our job is to point people to Jesus. That's what it's all about. Because I I got news for you. We're all going to have jobs in heaven, but I'm going to be unemployed. Okay? Because nobody in their right mind at 1 p.m. on the main field, Jesus At the tent, three miles from the stadium, Brian Persley. Free tickets to all, right? Nobody's coming to my tent. I don't want to be in my tent. I want to go to the stadium and see Jesus. That's what it's all about. So never never confuse this fact. Never confuse this fact. Everybody here, everybody here, all of us, all of us are servants, We all use our gifts. We all use our abilities to point people to Jesus. But we're not the point. It's all about Him. It's all about Jesus. It's never about the servants. And so that doesn't mean you shouldn't have favorite artists. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have favorite podcasts. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't have favorite authors. But never mistake the fact that the point should be them pointing you to Jesus and not their own empire. We're merely servants. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor, for we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. Again, he says, it's all about Jesus. We all have jobs to do. Some of the jobs are a little more little more visible than other jobs within the church. And some of the roles, he says, are are a little more time-consuming. They have to take a little more time to be devoted right there. I am so appreciative. I am so appreciative because of your faithful giving to Lakeside that I have the privilege of doing this. I'm so thankful that we had the ability to bring on Baxter a few months ago and to bring on Derek, who's starting in a couple weeks as our new worship arts pastor. I'm so thankful, but never... (laughs) Don't mistake the fact, it is because of your giving that this is possible. We don't have merchandise. We don't do bake sales. We don't sell, and and that's not to rip on anybody who does, but that's just not our approach. That's just not what we do. What we do is is we, we pass a basket around, and we ask God's people to contribute to make this possible so that we can devote our time and our energy on, on Lakeside, on helping you grow closer to Jesus, on reaching people who are far from him and showing them that there is hope. And so I just want to say on behalf, of, on behalf of myself, on behalf of Baxter, on behalf of, of Derek, who's coming on the team, thank you so much. Your giving enables this to happen. And if you stop, we're gone. All right, and now those of you who don't like us, don't use that as encouragement. Be like, well, ha ha, ha ha ha, I'm done giving the legs. All right, because you know God, God will still bless your stewardship even if you hate us. That's fine. But the reality is this: we are able to do what we do because of your faithful generosity. And so I just want to say, uh, personally, thank you so much for this incredible opportunity that I have to come and to pastor this church. So. Thank you very much. I, I just want to thank those of you who, who do give because of the impact of what we're able to do. In the last year, we've seen people give their lives to Jesus. That is the greatest transformation that could possibly happen. That's why we exist. It's why we do what we do, and we've seen it. And some of you here today are the lives who have been changed, and your life has drastically been changed. So we thank you for that. We've been able to meet people at the end of their rope who feel like they have nowhere else to turn to and encourage them. We've been able to walk with people through some of life's darkest moments, through situations we would never wish on our worst enemy, and help them understand that you can keep going. 
and we don't have all the answers for why God would allow all this to happen, but what we do know is God is a good God, and, and while we may not have all those answers, it's okay to ask those questions, and we're going to walk with you every step of the way. We've done that. We've been able to reach out to people when they had nowhere else to turn and they felt like they were isolated and alone and let them know that this is a community, that there are people who love and care about them and who are concerned about them. We've been able to pay our utility bills, which on days like today is really nice. It's nice to have heat. It's nice to have electricity. All that happens because of your contributions Thank you for supporting the work of Lakeside Community Church. He keeps going. According to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care of how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Again, it's all about Jesus. He's the foundation for everything that we do. He is the point of why we do what we do. And then he says this. Notice, I laid the foundation like a skilled master builder. That was my gift. I laid the foundation, but other people came and they built upon it, just as in a construction project. Now, generally, not one person does every facet of the work. You bring in electricians, you bring in plumbers, you bring in builders, you bring in countertop people, etc. All of that are different skills, different abilities. Some people have all of them, but many people are specialists. They're specialists. And he says, so it is in the church. We don't all have the same gift. We don't all have the same abilities. We don't all have the same skills. But what we do is we come together and we do what we can to build on the foundation. Jesus is the foundation. Now we all come alongside of that and we work with what we're able to do to build that up. Again, not to shine the spotlight on us, not that we would get the praise. It's not about us, but that we would lay on that we would lay on the foundation so that Jesus is glorified so that Jesus' name is proclaimed. They're different, but they complement one another. And that's why I just want to encourage you again, no matter, no matter who you are, you have an ability, you have a gift, you have a skill. And at some level, you need to be utilizing that for the glory of Jesus, if you're a Christ follower. If you're somebody who follows Jesus, you need to be engaged in using your abilities for him. This isn't a spectator thing. You don't get to follow Jesus, kick up your feet, and be like, this is fun. Everybody else does all the work. No, 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 no. God has gifted you with unique abilities and unique talents and unique gifts, and you need to utilize them for his glory. Now, check this out. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation, verse 12 says, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. What in the world does this mean? It means a couple things. First is this. But God sees our efforts. God sees our efforts. And God knows whether we are serving him with our best. Whether we're laying upon the foundation the equivalent of gold, of silver, of precious stones. Or whether we're laying on the foundation the equivalent of wood, of hay, and of straw. God sees our efforts, and he knows our motives, he knows our hearts, and he knows whether we are giving him our best and whether we are doing our best or whether we're just kind of throwing in some scraps and thinking, all right, well, I've done something. And not only that, but God sees the motive behind what we do. Because again, it's all about the fame of Jesus. And so he sees, and and he searches our hearts, and he knows what we've done for him. 
when you hear the sirens blaring, you see the lights, and you hear that unmistakable horn, and you see the fire trucks racing down the road, your heart just sinks. And if you've ever, unfortunately, been that family, or if you've known that family, whoever, who, whoever has, has had to endure and survive a house fire, The heartache and the sense of loss as they look at what once was their home that stored so many things that they cared about and so many memories ablaze and a pile of rubble. And as the smoke just continues to go up, there are tears, there's grief, and rightfully so. Yet, on the other hand, there's a gratitude. There's a gratitude to be alive. There's a gratitude that they've survived. They're excited for the fact that they're still alive. They're excited for the fact that they didn't die, that their family is alive, that they can look and they can just take into account of all that has been lost, but their lives have been saved. There is gratitude for that aspect. Anybody who's had to endure that would tell you they hope to never endure it again. Because while they're excited for the fact that they're still alive, there is a sense of loss of all that was. The question I have for you Because as you stand before God one day, as we all will, in all of your efforts, in all of your work, is thrown on that fire. Will it survive? Will it have been your best? with the motive of just seeing Jesus proclaimed. Will it have been your scraps? Will it have been what you had left over? Will it have been so that people look at you and think, wow, look at how generous they are. Wow, look at how amazing they are at this. Will it have been about your own platform? Because if so, it's going up in flames. And it doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean that that God doesn't want anything. No, 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 don't misunderstand. You're still a follower of Jesus, and you're still saved, and you're still in heaven for all eternity, but there will be a sense of loss. For what was. Are you giving your best? Do you not know that you are God's temple? And that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. So right as we are on the heels of this discussion that is, again, isn't an issue of salvation, but is an issue of God's rewarding you, of all of, of all of your efforts being tested as by fire, and the best efforts holding up, and the scraps being burnt away, the question, the, on the heels of that, he says this, and be encouraged. He says, be encouraged. You are God's temple. And God's spirit dwells in you. The very God who created you, for those of you who follow Jesus, is alive and at work within you. And if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. That is your value. That is your worth. That God looks at you and loves you so much that he says, I've got you. I got you. 
You're mine. And if anybody messes with you, they mess with me. So you might be here and you might be questioning, what is your value? What is your worth? Do you matter to God? And, and let me just tell you, you couldn't matter more to God. You couldn't matter more. So what do we do with all this? Well, the first thing is this. If you're new to following Jesus, welcome to the most exciting journey of your life. It's great. And understand, you're a work in progress. We all are. It's not going to happen instantaneously. It's not going to happen overnight. Your life looking more and more like Jesus is a process. So don't become discouraged and take heart. If you've been following Jesus for a while, then nobody can tell. Do better. I, I say that in, in all the love I can. Do better. You're capable of more. So we're not mad at you. We're not angry at you. But we're just telling you because we love you, do better. You can. It might require some work. It might require some more intentionality. It might require some more effort. You got this. Do better. Whereas Paul said, he said, grow up. Grow up. And yeah, it's going, there are going to be some bumps and some bruises along the way, and there's going to be some hard choices, but don't you want a steak dinner instead of milk all the time? If you follow Jesus, don't be jealous or argumentative. Don't be jealous or argumentative. This is, this is the test. This is the test for how you're doing spiritually. Are you jealous of people? Or are you argumentative? Because if so, something's out of balance. Focus on Jesus. That's who it's all about. That's what it's all about. Make him your focus. And as people who follow Jesus, let's make sure that we love God, we love others, we give Him our best, and we serve to the best of our ability. And one day, when we see Him face to face, we'll receive a reward that doesn't burn up and can never be taken away. God, I pray that you would help us be people who are always passionate about helping the marginalized, about help, helping those who feel down and out. And pointing them to you. That we would understand the incredible hope that changes our lives through a relationship with Jesus. I pray, God, for the person here who's just started following you, and I pray that they wouldn't become discouraged because they're not exactly where they want to be, but they would just continue to work. I pray, God, for the person who's here who's been following you for a really long time and yet who's stagnant and whose life doesn't look like it should. God, I pray that they wouldn't beat themselves up. I pray that they wouldn't believe that it's all over for them. But I pray, God, that they would just make a commitment right now, right even in this moment, within their hearts to say, I'm going to do better. I'm going to grow up. I pray, God, that we wouldn't be jealous people. I pray that we wouldn't be eager to fight. But I pray that we would be known by all as people who love you. And love each other. God, as you're our focus, I pray that we'd grow closer to you. And I pray we would be a people who do our best to serve you and give to you. With all that we have. For all that you are. In your son Jesus' name we pray.